Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today we'll examine several illustrated examples of the combined gas laws. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewers watch the combined gas law lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now and return to this lecture when you are so qualified. Before we begin, I wanted to mention that the circuit simulations and schematics in this lecture were created using Automation Studio, a product of FAMIC Technologies. This is a tool I'll be using with greater frequency in upcoming lectures. If you need more information about Automation Studio, visit their website at www.famictech.com. Master the combined gas laws necessitate active participation on your part, and as such, I'm encouraging you to please pause the lecture when asked to do so and attempt the example problems on your own. If your answers do not match those illustrated, by all means, feel free to rewind the lecture and correct any mistakes you may have made. Before we head into the illustrated examples, a quick review of the combined gas laws. You'll no doubt recall certain conditions define the standard cubic foot of air, notably a temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit, a relative humidity of 36%, and atmospheric conditions at sea level, i.e. 0 psi gauge or 14.7 psi absolute. Only in these conditions will a standard cubic foot of air occupy one cubic foot of volume, being a cube 12 inches high, 12 inches wide, and 12 inches deep, or 1,728 cubic inches. As you are no doubt aware, at higher pressure conditions, a standard cubic foot of air will occupy less volume, whereas at lower pressure conditions, the same cubic feet of air will occupy more volume. But importantly, it remains a standard cubic foot of air. In this capacity, a standard cubic foot of air is not a measurement of volume, but rather a unit of quantity, i.e. a fixed mass of gas that can be compressed or expanded. The conditions defining the standard cubic foot are simply a snapshot of some agreed upon state for basis of comparison. Let's try three quick thought experiments involving the combined gas laws. Thought experiment one. At sea level, three identical balloons are filled with one standard cubic foot of air and then placed in three different locations. One on top of a 68 degree Fahrenheit mountain, 10,000 feet in the air, one on a 68 degree Fahrenheit beach, and another at the bottom of a 10,000 foot deep oceanic trench also at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. My question to you is this, how will pressure, less on the mountain, more at the bottom of the ocean, affect the volume of these balloons? Note, temperature is being kept constant in all three scenarios. Undoubtedly, the balloon at the top of the mountain will be larger than the balloon in the beach and much, much larger than the one at the bottom of the ocean. Importantly, each balloon still contains one standard cubic foot of air. I must remind you a standard cubic foot of air simply occupies more or less volume at different pressure conditions. A standard cubic foot of air is not a measurement of volume, but rather a quantity of gas. This thought experiment perfectly illustrates Boyle's law, which states given constant temperature, pressure one times volume one equals pressure two times volume two, where the subscripts one and two mean initial and final conditions. Given three known properties, one can solve for the fourth unknown property. Thought experiment two. At sea level, three identical balloons are again filled with one standard cubic foot of air and placed in three different locations, all at sea level. One hovering over an active volcano, one on a 68 degree Fahrenheit beach, and another in an open-sided Minnesota hockey rink midwinter. My question to you is this. How will temperature, more in the volcano, less in the hockey rink, affect the volume of the balloons? Note, pressure is being kept constant in all three scenarios. Undoubtedly, the balloon in the volcano will be larger than the one on the beach and much, much larger than the one in the hockey rink. Importantly, each balloon still contains one standard cubic foot of air. Again, the standard cubic foot of air simply occupies more or less volume at different temperature conditions. This thought experiment perfectly illustrates Charles' law, which states, given constant pressure, Volume 1 divided by temperature 1 equals volume 2 divided by temperature 2, where again the subscripts 1 and 2 mean the initial and final states. Given three known properties, one can solve for the fourth unknown property. Lastly, thought experiment 3. Three rigid aluminum containers are filled with one standard cubic foot of air and placed in three different locations. One stuffed on a roaring campfire, one on a 68 degree Fahrenheit beach, and another encased in a glacier. My question to you is this. How will temperature, more in the campfire, less in the glacier, affect the pressure exerted by the confined gas inside the rigid containers? Note volume in the rigid containers being kept constant in all three scenarios. 
Undoubtedly, the container in the campfire will experience more pressure than the one on the beach and much, much more pressure than the one in the glacier. This thought experiment perfectly illustrates Guy Lussac's law, which states given constant volume, pressure 1 divided by temperature 1 equals pressure 2 divided by temperature 2, where again the subscripts 1 and 2 mean the initial and final conditions. Given three known properties, one can solve for a fourth unknown property. Lastly, lastly, it needs to be said that Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, and Guy Lussac's laws only work in terms of absolute, not relative, temperatures and pressures. Temperature must be measured from absolute zero, something the Fahrenheit and Celsius scales do not do, but the Rankine and Kelvin scales do. Similarly, pressure must be measured from perfect vacuum, something the gauge scale does not do, but the absolute scale does. This implies that one must be adept at converting temperature from a relative scale like Fahrenheit or Celsius to an absolute scale like Rankine or Kelvin and vice versa, as well as skilled at converting pressure from gauge to absolute and vice versa. Unless explicitly specified otherwise, all pressure measurements are gauge readings. You recall zero degrees Rankine is roughly equivalent to negative 459.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Zero degrees Kelvin is roughly equivalent to negative 273.2 degrees Celsius, and zero PSI gauge is roughly equivalent to 14.7 PSI absolute. To yield usable results, one may necessitate additional conversions depending upon the desired units. This concludes the brief review. Let's begin with the illustrated examples. Problem 1. Consider a rigid metal receiver pressurized to 95 PSI in a 68 degree Fahrenheit workshop, then brought out to a job site at Furnace Creek Ranch in Death Valley, California and left in the hot sun reaching a temperature of 134.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's say the safety relief valve opens at exactly 120 PSI. Does the safety relief valve blow? To see if it does or not, determine the pressure in the receiver in the elevated temperature condition. We're presuming the volume of the rigid metal receiver remains constant. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The scenario is clearly calling for application of Guy Lussac's law. Given constant volume, pressure and temperature are related in the following fashion. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Given increased temperature at the job site, pressure in the receiver will undoubtedly rise. Is it enough to blow the safety relief valve? We'll see. First, convert the two temperatures to the Rankine scale, and then convert gauge pressure to absolute. 95 PSI gauge is roughly equivalent to 109.7 PSI absolute. 68 degrees Fahrenheit is equivalent to 527.7 degrees Rankine, and finally 134.1 degrees Fahrenheit is equivalent to 593.8 degrees Rankine. We know P1, T1, and T2. We want to determine unknown pressure P2. An algebraic manipulation of Guy Lussac's law solved for P2 demonstrates P2 is equal to P1 times T2 over T1. Substituting in the given values, P2 is found to be roughly 123.4 PSI absolute. You might say, yes, the safety pressure relief does indeed blow, but you're forgetting an important final step. This is pressure inside the receiver expressed using the absolute scale. You need to convert this back to the gauge scale. A unit conversion demonstrates 123.4 PSI absolute is roughly equivalent to 108.7 PSI gauge. The safety pressure relief valve stays closed. Problem 2. This is a pretty fun one. Consider this simple pneumatic circuit consisting of two identical unloaded cylinders. The regulator is set to 60 PSI. When I open valve 1, unloaded cylinder 1 extends and pressure in gauge 1 rises and stabilizes at 60 PSI, as one might expect. If I close valve 1, cylinder 1 remains extended and pressure gauge 1 remains at 60 PSI. All right, here's two questions. What happens to unloaded cylinder 2 and what does pressure gauge 2 read if I open valve 2? If you're looking for cylinder dimensions, pick some. The key is cylinder 1 and cylinder 2 are identical and unloaded. For the purposes of this problem, we're assuming temperature remains constant. Again, cylinder 1 and cylinder 2 are identical and unloaded. I'll give you a hint. I'm basically doubling volume when I open valve 2. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. 
This is clearly a Boyle's Law problem, which relates pressure and volume at constant temperature. When valve 2 opens, the pressurized air trapped in cylinder 1's cap end expands into cylinder 2's cap end. Given both cylinders are unloaded, cylinder 2 extends. Given both cylinders are identical, we've effectively doubled volume, such that V2 equals 2 times V1. What does pressure do? Given volume doubled, you might rush to the incorrect conclusion that pressure is in half and expect gauge 2 to read 30 psi. But not only is that wrong, it is absolutely wrong. Note the emphasis on the term absolute. It is categorically incorrect to say that if volume doubles, pressure is cut in half. It is, however, entirely proper to say if volume doubles, absolute pressure is halved. 60 psi gauge is equivalent to 74.7 psi absolute. Given V2 is equal to 2 times V1, and solving for pressure 2, it's half of P1. This yields an absolute pressure of 37.4 psi absolute, which is equivalent to 22.7 psi gauge. Let this be a lesson about those tricky problems in textbooks and tests which feature statements like pressure doubles or temperature doubles. Using the absolute scale as one must when employing the combined gas laws, 50 psi gauge is not half as much pressure as 100 psi gauge, nor is 80 degrees Fahrenheit twice as hot as 40 degrees Fahrenheit. If a problem doesn't specify absolute or gauge, seek clarification from your instructor. Problem 3. Let's step this up a notch. Lest you think all combined gas law problems necessitate starting conditions that define the standard cubic foot, i.e. atmospheric conditions at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, consider a different initial state. You recall the gas laws are ratios of four properties. As long as you account for absolutes, given three knowns, you should be able to solve for the fourth unknown given any starting state. This problem is a little tricky, so let's tackle it in stages. Consider a pneumatic cylinder with the following dimensions. Cap diameter 4.5 inches, a rod diameter of 2.25 inches, and a travel length of 16 inches. Part 1. Determine the pressure necessary to fully lift a 2,000 pound weight when oriented in the following fashion. You'll note in this orientation, lifting the weight makes use of the full cap end area. Part 2. At full extension, the valve is moved to the closed position and an additional 800 pounds is stacked on top. What's the cylinder do? Given air is compressible, we might expect this additional weight to compress the cylinder and thus change its extension length. Solve for this length. Again, assume this occurs at constant temperature. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. This is again a Boyle's Law problem which relates pressure and volume at constant temperature. First, we got to determine the initial pressure and the volume conditions. We need to make use of Pascal's Law. You do remember Pascal's Law, don't you? The cap has an area of roughly 15.9 square inches. An application of Pascal's Law demonstrates that a pressure of roughly 125.8 psi should be sufficient to lift the 2,000 pound object. Lastly, at full extension, the volume of the cap end is roughly 254.5 cubic inches. We now have our initial pressure and our initial volume conditions. When the valve moves to the closed position, we have a known volume of pressurized air trapped in the cap end of the cylinder. When 800 more pounds is stacked on top, force increases, pressure increases, and volume should decrease. Let's solve for the increased pressure. The increased force still acts on an area of roughly 15.9 square inches. An application of Pascal's Law demonstrates the cap end experiences increased pressure of roughly 176.1 psi. Let's set up the Boyle's Law relationship. P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. We know P1 and V1 and P2. We need to solve for unknown volume V2. An algebraic manipulation of Boyle's Law solving for unknown volume V2 suggests that unknown volume equals P1 times V1 divided by P2. Now before you wrongheadedly substitute P1 and P2 as presently constituted into this equation, you need to convert them to the absolute scale. 125.8 psi gauge is equivalent to 140.5 psi absolute, and 176.1 psi gauge is equivalent to 190.8 psi absolute. Substituting these values into the algebraic manipulation of Boyle's Law, 
demonstrates that V2 will be compressed into a volume of 187.4 cubic inches, the additional force having compressed the initial volume into a smaller size. Now what? We know the area and the volume of the cylinder, we just need to solve for height. Volume of a cylinder is area times height. An algebraic manipulation of this formula, solved for unknown height, demonstrates unknown height is equal to volume over area. Substituting in our given values demonstrates the cylinder handling this increased load only extends roughly 11.8 inches. This problem really illustrates one of the features of pneumatics, that of compressibility. Whereas the incompressible nature of oil-based hydraulics are rigid and solid, the spongy nature of a pressurized air means a pneumatic system can act like a shock absorber. Okay, next problem. Let's do think all combined gas laws necessitate U.S. customary units. Consider this scenario employing metric units. You note the combined gas laws are ratios. As long as you remain consistent and account for absolutes, you can use whatever units you wish. Let's say someone rapidly charges up a rubber bladder to a specified pressure so it occupies 3 liters of volume. In the act of compression, the bladder reaches an elevated temperature of 32 degrees Celsius warmed to the touch on the Celsius scale, then it's set outside on a 10 degrees Celsius day, a cool but not cold temperature using the Celsius scale. Let's say the pressure inside the bladder remains constant. Once the bladder cools back down to 10 degrees Celsius, what size is it in units of liters? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. This is clearly a Charles Law problem, which relates volume and temperature at constant pressure. Given pressure remains the same and the bladder cools from 32 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius, you might expect it to shrink. Let's see if this is the case. First, we need to convert the relative temperatures in the Celsius scale to absolutes using Kelvin. 32 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 305.2 degrees Kelvin. 10 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 283.2 degrees Kelvin. Charles' law states V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2. We know V1, T1, and T2, we need to solve for V2. An algebraic manipulation of the Charles Law formula suggests that unknown V2 is equal to V1 divided by T1 times T2. Substituting our given values demonstrates V2 has dropped to roughly 2.8 liters. Before we move on to our final illustrated example, I'd like to take a moment to remind the viewer that the three gas laws, Boyle's Law, Charles Law, and Gila Sox can be combined, hence the name, into one gas law such that P1 times V1 divided by T1 equals P2 times V2 divided by T2. The three laws themselves are simply variations of this single formula where one property is held constant. In the case of Boyle's law, T1 equals T2, such that P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. In Charles' law, P1 equals P2, such that V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2. And Guy Lussac's law, V1 equals V2, such that P1 divided by T1 equals P2 divided by T2. If you do have a scenario in which you know all five properties of an ideal gas, one can easily solve for the sixth unknown using the larger combined gas formula. I don't really intend to go to this length of computational difficulty with these illustrated examples. However, it is worth a moment of our time to at least briefly examine one classic application of this multivariable phenomenon, that of charging a gas accumulator in a fluid power system. Before we get to this application, allow me to briefly refresh isotherms. You recall from the combined gas lecture, one can plot pressure versus volume at constant temperatures, i.e. Boyle's Law, on a plot that looks something like this. At temperature T1, a quantity of gas occupies a certain volume and exerts a specific pressure. Maintaining temperature constant, if we reduce the volume, pressure increases as one might expect. Using the same chart, we can also plot the pressure and volume relationships at different temperatures. For example, at increased temperature T2, where again T2 is greater than T1, pressure and volume might be related in the following fashion. As previously, at constant temperature T2, a quantity of gas occupies a certain volume and exerts a specific pressure. Maintaining temperature at T2, if we reduce the volume, pressure increases as we might expect no surprises here. These isotherms also simultaneously illustrate Charles and Guy Lussac's law. At constant pressure, i.e. Charles' law, a quantity of gas at temperature 1 
occupies a certain volume. If we increase temperature to T2, volume increases as we might expect. Similarly, at constant volume, i.e. Guy Lussac's law, a quantity of gas at T1 exerts a certain pressure. If we increase temperature to T2, that same volume of gas exerts more pressure as we might expect. Real world scenarios sometimes involve changes in all three variables. Again, the classic example being charging a pneumatic accumulator in a fluid power system, the intended purpose of this digression. As Charles Law so nicely illustrates, changes in temperature result in changes in volume as do changes in volume result in changes in temperature. Rapid compression is often associated with a temperature rise. This is why a compressor room is often so warm. In contrast, rapid expansion is often associated with a temperature drop. This is why dump valves often freeze shut. In a perfect world, accumulators should be charged and discharged slowly enough such that any temperature change associated with compression or expansion is dissipated to the environment and temperature remains constant. In such isothermal events, i.e. constant temperature events, one would simply follow the given temperature isotherm, let's say T1, and as volume is decreased, pressure predictably increases. The real world isn't always that simple. Consider a more realistic rapid adiabatic compression event, where the act of reducing the volume without dissipating the heat of compression not only increases the pressure, but also shifts from the lower T1 isotherm to the higher T2 isotherm. The compression or reduction in volume has resulted in both a pressure and a temperature increase. Both these observations keeping in spirit with Boyle's and Charles' law. This is a pretty self-explanatory phenomenon for most technically inclined individuals. What may not be so readily apparent is that the temperature rise associated with compression is only temporary in nature. Eventually, whatever you pressurize is going to cool back down to environmental conditions. It's going to drop back down to T1. If you do this in a constant volume fashion, i.e. in the manner of Gilles Socks, that same volume now exerts less pressure at a reduced temperature. This is why you might charge up an accumulator to a specified pressure, only to come back after it's cooled down to find pressure has decreased. Even more complex, if volume isn't being held constant, you might move from T2 to T1 as the gas cools in this fashion and observe not only a drop in pressure, but also a reduction in volume for the same quantity of gas. In summary, there's a lot going on with pressure, volume, and temperature. Pressure at the end of a rapid adiabatic charge is not what you're going to get once the device cools back down to the external environment. All right, last problem. This one's pretty easy since you're ugly and I take pity upon you. Consider a rigid gas cylinder charged up to a pressure of 70 psi in a 70 degree Fahrenheit facility that's being sent out to a remote job site with notoriously cold weather conditions. How cold can this cylinder get so pressure doesn't fall below 60 psi? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Given this is a rigid cylinder and volume should remain constant, this is another setup for a perfect Guy Lussac problem, which relates pressure and temperature at constant volume. We first need to convert temperatures in the relative Fahrenheit scale to absolute using Rankine and pressure engaged absolute. 70 degrees Fahrenheit is roughly equivalent to 529.7 degrees Rankine. 70 PSI gauge is equivalent to 84.7 PSI absolute. And 60 PSI gauge is equivalent to 74.7 PSI absolute. Guy Lussac's law states that P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. We know P1, T1, and P2. We need to solve for T2. Using a fancy inversion at the start, an algebraic manipulation of Guy Lussac's law suggests that unknown T2 is equal to T1 over P1 times P2. Substituting in our given values demonstrates T2 is roughly 467.2 degrees Rankine, which is roughly equivalent to 7.5 degrees Fahrenheit, below freezing but entirely expected in the Great Plains in the winter, even on a nice day. Ask me how I know. All right, that's about it for today. In conclusion, this lecture took a look at illustrated examples and practical applications of Boyle's, Charles, and Guy Lussac's The Combined Gas Laws. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.